in Vietnam, I said, you know what? I need to do eight hours a day. So in Vietnam, it was the first time that I got, I got, you know what I did in Vietnam is I got a list of people who wanted to practice with me. I did the same thing in Vietnam. I put signs up everywhere. My phone was blown up with people who wanted to trade English for Vietnamese. And what I did was. Hi, Jeff. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. First of all, it's, it's really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And well, just, um, first of all, why, why don't you tell us about your, your experience with languages? Like, you know, your LA failure, mm -hmm. like we all did, <laughs> like yeah. you know, successes or yeah, anything that you think is relevant. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about me. I've been studying languages, acquiring language, actually, since I was in high school. So I officially started at 17, but I, when I was very small, uh, when I was probably, God, was like 10 years old, we had a, we had a, just a woman who worked for us, and because we had five kids, so we had this woman who came to our house every day, and she helped my mom. She helped my mom with cleaning and cooking and everything. And she was a Spanish speaker and my mom spoke to her in Spanish, uh, you know, broken Spanish. And I was like, wow, this is fantastic. And so I would, I would try to speak to her in Spanish too. So as a 10 year old child, the first thing I learned was dos sandwiches, a leche chocolate. <laughs> dos sandwiches, a leche chocolate. And she would ask me, she would say this, she would say, ¿Quieres el pan tostado? And as a 10 year old boy, I recognized that pan tostado mean toasted bread. And I was like, see, sí. so at the age of 10, that was my first experience with speaking another language besides English was with this helper that came to our house every day and helped my mom with five kids. And I was just amazed. I could say something and she would understand me. So that was 10 years old. Then when I was 17, when I was 17 years old, I got a job. Uh, my parents told me you have to either study or get a job. And I didn't want to study. I said, I am not studying. I hate studying because, you know, from kindergarten through 11th grade, school was not for me. So I said, okay, fine, I'll get a job. I got a job at a restaurant in Southern California. It was called the Seafood Broiler. It was a seafood restaurant. It's not there anymore. Uh, the Seafood Broiler, I was 17. I was hired to be a busboy, a cook, and a fish cutter. I had to cut fish. So I was just a 17 year old boy. They paid me something like $4 an hour back then. And it was full of Spanish speakers. So in the back of the kitchen, I was in the back of the kitchen. I was a bus boy. I was a cook. I was a fish cutter. Uh, all of the people in the back of the kitchen, most of the people spoke Spanish. They were from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras in that order. Because in Southern California, we're so close to Mexico. So Most of the Spanish speakers were Mexican, and then after that was El Salvador and then Guatemala and Honduras. And I became best friends with these people, just best friends with them. And they they took me as like a son, and they taught me Spanish. So what I acquired, I didn't learn. I always tell people I didn't learn Spanish in school. I acquired Spanish naturally like a baby, like a child, and they taught me everything. They taught me the bad words. They taught me, please and thank you. They taught me, can you give me this? And they were just wonderful people. We became best friends. And I carried a dictionary with me everywhere. So I had a dictionary, a Spanish-English dictionary, and I would just look up words left and right. And we, I was a cook, and they were a cook too, so we would cook together. Mm -hmm. And then I found this guy named, named Herbert Pacheco. Herbert Pacheco. I'll never forget this man. He was a young man like me. He was learning English, and I was learning Spanish. And we would go back and forth on words we didn't know. So he would, if he heard a word in English he didn't know, he would ask me to translate it. If I heard a word in Spanish I didn't know, I would ask him to translate it, or I'd look it up in my dictionary. So this went on every day or five days a week for a year. And we, after work, we went out. We drank beer together. We went to a couple of parties together. Mm. It was just wonderful. And so after a year, I was fluent in Spanish. Everybody was like, whoa, hey, ¿por qué tú hablas español con fluidez? I was like, trabajo con un montón de gente de México, Salvador, Guatemala y Honduras. Y somos amigos y vamos y tomamos juntos y no sé. So for me, it was just wonderful experience. These are language parents. 
I didn't know it at the time, but these were my language parents, and they took me under their wings. Yeah. They told me stories about their 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 immig immigrating to this country, the hardships in their countries, mm. the families, and the fact that they were all sending money back to their families in their countries. I was like, wow, amazed. And you know, the work they did to get here, they you know they they had to come illegally, mm. ninety. Probably nine out of ten of them were here illegally, and you know I, I took them as my brother, and so it was just a wonderful experience. And after that, you know, long story short, my mom said you should try you should try French. I mm. took French because I spoke Spanish so well. My French was I was just like bam, I got it. I took French, and then I took Italian, and then I took Chinese, and then Vietnamese, and then Arabic. And I did Farsi. So altogether, I've done eight languages in the last, I don't know, 45 years. I'm 55. So in 55 years, I've acquired eight languages. Mm. And that's it. So I fell in love with Spanish first. Spanish is my first love. Uh, my second language is Spanish. I decided to be a Spanish teacher, a Spanish professor. Mm. And it's really well. So that's my current careers. I am a Spanish professor full time. And I love it. I love every second of it. Mm. Actually, that's not true. I love it most of the time. <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell. Oh, that's yeah. I can see there's. I mean, in that early experience, there's it just it was comprehensive input all over the place, and and you yeah. were just getting exposed to the language. What like eight, nine, ten uh, hours a day? No, because I had to work, you know. So I did the math. I did the math. I think it was about a thousand hours. I think I did about a thousand hours in the first year. So you know, if you if if you you know if you divide a thousand by three sixty five, comes out to about three hours a day. So we were doing about three hours a day because we were working literally at, next to each other, hand in hand. Right, hand in hand. We were we were partners. We were cutting fish. We were cooking. We were washing dishes, prepping you know vegetables, etc. Together. So it was about three hours a day. It was about a thousand. I did about a thousand hours in one year, yeah. and that was more than enough. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good estimation. How mm -hmm. long it can take when, when it comes to languages like you know? Yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. I've I've I've, I've um, recently I've discovered that Spanish for an English speaker, Spanish only takes six hundred hours. It really only takes six hundred hours. So maybe it was six hundred hours. Maybe maybe it was just 600 hours, but it was definitely at least 600, possibly 1,000, because even the summers, you know, I was practicing with these guys in the summers. We were hanging out. We were going to parties together. We were fishing together. We were doing stuff outside of work together. They were my friends and my workmates and my language parents. Yeah, it, it might depend on, I mean, it might take you 600 to get to a point in which you can start communicating naturally, mm -hmm. but getting to 1,000, allow you to be even more fluent than that or it, it, Correct. depending on the on input itself you know but yeah. it might be different or the way you count it right yeah and i'm curious because and after your experience with spanish when you started with french italian and so on were you did you try to replicate the, the experience right away or did yeah. you realize that okay there's something here in this way yeah. of learning yeah that's a good question a wonderful question you know i took french Right after I took Spanish, I took French, and it was okay because I was practicing with the students in the class. I was practicing with the teacher and the students in the class, and I was probably one of the top students in the class. Mm. I loved it. I wanted to acquire or learn French. My motivation was just through the roof. My motivation was 100%. Uh, it wasn't until I actually started to go to different countries. I had been to eight different countries. It wasn't until I thought, I thought to myself, you know what? I really need to ramp this up. I have to go to the country where that language is spoken. And I've done eight different countries or seven different countries. So it was the French. The first thing I did was I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go to France. So I went to France for three months. It was right after I started teaching in college. And I went for a whole summer. And I refuse to speak English. I refuse uh -huh. to speak English. And I brought a little dog with me. I brought a dog, my dog Angie, with my first dog many years ago. And that helps. <laughs> C'est très mignon. They, always, they all wanted to say, C'est très mignon. 
uh, they would say, Ella Kelange, Ella Kelange, how old is she? So it was just this great prop to meet people. But, you know, I don't need props. They help. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did in France was, you know, actually what I did is I went to the library and the bookstore. Just, no, I went to the library and the bookstore and I put up ads. I put up little ads at the library and the bookstore in France saying, if you want to speak English, call me. I'll help you with your English if you help me with your French. And my phone was just blowing up. I had to go and take the ad off. So uh -huh. I found people to practice with. I found people to practice with. And in, in France, in France, I did about, I'd say about three hours a day. So three hours a day for 30, for, for 90 days. You know, I was there for three months. This is a three, three months. wasn't a one month study, brother. This is three months. Right. So you think about it, 90 days, three hours a day, it's about 270 hours of French. And I already had about a hundred. So mm -hmm. let's say 400, I've had 400 hours of French. I'm very happy with my French after 400 hours. Very happy. Je suis très content avec mon français. Je suis confortable dans mon français. And, you know, because um, French has so many cognates, it's very easy for me to say. Right. French. And French is a level one language also. Had I done 600 hours in French, si saw all dans français, my French would be uh, perfectly fluent. Right now, I'd say it's advanced, low, low advanced French. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy, very happy with my French. No, no, no. Exciting. So I replicated that for the, all my other languages. Right. So, long story short, I I went to Italy. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to Italy. The same exact thing in Italy. The same exact thing in Italy. And then I said, I'm going to go to Vietnam. I did the same exact thing in Vietnam. And all these countries, I practiced. You know, once I got to Italy and Vietnam, I said, you know what? I can't do three hours a day. I got to do it eight hours a day. So in, in Vietnam, Vietnam was the first time I did French, France and Italy. You know, I had fun, met a bunch of people, drank coffee, did about three hours a day. In Vietnam, I said, you know what? I need to do eight hours a day. So in Vietnam, it was the first time that I got, I got, you know what I did in Vietnam is I got a list of people who wanted to practice with me. I did the same thing in Vietnam. I put signs up everywhere. My phone was blown up with people who wanted to trade English for Vietnamese. And what I did was I had my three regulars and I would meet at the same restaurant. Mm -hmm. I had a 10 o'clock, a 12 o'clock, a one o'clock and a four o'clock. And I had these boys and girls. They were just, you know, in their 18, 19, twenties, they wanted to practice their English. And of course they did. And they would come and sit down and we would speak Vietnamese all day. And I would trade English for Vietnamese and I got a tutor and I paid for a private tutor. So in France and Italy, I actually took classes because, you know, France and Italy are a little expensive. Right. Uh, Vietnam, super cheap. Love Vietnam. I just got a private tutor and I paid a private tutor. And we did about two or three hours a day with my private tutor. So in Vietnam, I was doing eight hours a day. It worked. It worked great. And I loved it. And, uh, but I was only in Vietnam for four weeks. So it was during a Christmas yeah. or a vacation. So Vietnam, I did four weeks, 40 hours a week. That's 160 hours. I did another 50 hours of Vietnamese here. So I did about 200 hours of Vietnamese. Now, Vietnamese is a level four language. It's not going to take 600 hours. Right. It's going to take around 1,100 hours. Mm -hmm. I figure I did 200 hours of Vietnamese, 250 hours of Vietnamese. Woof. I got a lot more left. And Vietnamese is an extremely difficult language. I speak, still speak Vietnamese every day. I just say hello and goodbye. How are you? And mm -hmm. it's that. So that was Vietnam. And then, you know, I replicated the same thing. And uh, from Vietnam, I went to, um, I think after Vietnam was uh, Egypt. So Egypt, I did ooh, 40 hours a week. I, I feel like I did 50 hours a week in Egypt uh, for three months. Plus, I did 300 hours of Arabic in here. So I did, and then I did, you know, I did Mexico and Spain. In Spain, I did a master's degree in Spain. So that counts too. So altogether, it was six or seven countries. And so my eighth language is Farsi. Farsi, when I started Farsi, I had an Iranian girlfriend, wonderful woman, love her and missed her terribly. And uh, we did Farsi. She was in Orange County, California. We have many Farsi speakers. Right. And I met her and uh, she was wonderful. And I, I hired a private Farsi tutor and I did, I don't know, 200 hours of Farsi. And after doing, after doing Arabic, Farsi is a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. Far part of the, you need a language of the, uh, Farsi is so easy 
Arabic is so difficult. So <laughs> once I started, I see it's like, what? You have one pronoun, un? Your verbs don't have gender? Oh my God. For the easiest language I've ever acquired. So I'm very happy. Farsi. Um, I've let it go. You know, I could probably speak 10 minutes of Farsi and that's fine. You know, it's, that's the brain yeah. work. You don't practice, he loops it. And that's perfectly fine. I, I know when I meet Farsi speaking people here in Orange County, which I do almost every day, I speak to them in Farsi. They're amazed. I love it. And if I were to make friends that spoke Farsi, my Farsi, I would get those language parents. I would find language parents and mm-hmm. just, you know, all my Farsi. Mm-hmm. And it's okay that I'm losing my Farsi. It's okay that I'm losing. Oh, China. I forgot about China. China, I did the same thing. I went to um, Dali in China, mm-hmm. three months in China, 40 hours a week in China. I had my regular trades in China. I had private tutor in China. Same thing. So those are my six or seven countries. So that's it. That's all my eight languages now. So I've done eight so far, and I'm very happy with all of them. I'm losing all of them. I'm losing every language I speak, and that's just the brain. That's just the brain works. I'm losing my English every day. I figure, how do you say that in English? I know it's Spanish. I just don't know it in English, and it is perfect. And I'm perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm not fluent in seven or eight languages. Mm-hmm. I'm fluent in two or three. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Right, so, right. Am I fluent? I'm semi fluent in seven or eight, and I'm a that. Right, right. Yeah, I always, I always talk about it. That I'm, I'm perfectly fine with some of the languages that I'm learning. Mm-hmm. Just getting to a point in which I can understand native content, for example. Like I don't need to get to native like level for us. Well, uh, Right. Yeah. But it's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah, native fluency. Oh my God. Native fluency. Oof. I don't even know if it's possible. If you lived in right. the country, if you live in the country, absolutely, you're going to acquire native fluency. Unless you live in the country. I mean, if you're married to a native speaker, yeah. But if, unless you're married to a native speaker or um, you live in the country, I don't think anybody can a- a- attain native fluency. I probably will never attain native fluency in Spanish. Mm-hmm. I moved back to right. area. Even if I married a, a, a native Spanish speaker, I probably still wouldn't speak mm-hmm. natively. We would speak English a lot. Right. No, I mean, when... Just... Yeah, when, when I said native, like, I mean, like, a high level. Like, for example, yeah. with, with my English, I can use it in any situation, in any, yeah. any way. I can, you know, I can give keynotes in English. I, I'm fine with it. Yep, yep. But well, what I mean is in some of the other languages, I'm fine just getting to a point in which I can understand, you know, YouTube videos, documentaries, books, yeah. whatever it is. It, it, it opens up a world of opportunities just yeah. with that. Absolutely. And yeah, and to, to add to what you said, and the, the good thing right now is that obviously if you if you can do what you did, that's that's an amazing way to go about it. But right now you can, you know, with through apps and watching videos and so on, you can do it yeah. from your own house, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because I um yeah, because for example, that's what I'm doing with German now. Like wow. I've, I've been getting exposed to it for a while. And now like a couple of weeks ago I decided to start a sort of an experiment, but I'm I'm loving it. I'm I'm getting exposed to German for three hours a day. What app are you using for German? I'm using I'm I'm not using any specific app. I'm using mostly YouTube videos. So I've been okay, okay. I I've been I've been getting exposed to German for a year and a half, couple of years through comprehensive input videos, YouTube yeah. videos. And so on. So I've gotten to a point in which I, I don't speak German yet, but I can understand quite a bit. Yeah. But I, I'm, just, I'm just watching, you know, things that I'm interested in. Yeah. And b- because I, I've been doing it for a couple of years, now I can understand many more things and I can get exposed for three hours and not get tired because I enjoy it, right? It's not like I'm watching cartoons for three hours a day. I, I might get tired of that, right? <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah, but there's a new, there's a new, um, what's a good word to call it? A wave or a new experiment going on in language acquisition today. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who are acquiring languages without people. No people. Right. Right. So I belong to a Facebook group called Language Learning Without Pain. You can look them up. They're a wonderful group. I, I'm on it. I'm on it. Yeah. You're on it. Okay. That's how we probably met. <laughs> so uh, these are people who are specifically acquiring languages 
for the most part without people. Right. And I'm like, wow, you're acquiring languages without people. Right. So they're dedicated to YouTube videos and really good apps. I'll say right now, the only app I know of which is good is called LinkQ. Yeah. Like Q, Steve Kaufman mm -hmm. all runs this app, and I have a lot of respect for Steve Kaufman. He's another polyglot such as myself. So if you're going to use any app, I would go to LinkQ, L-I-N-Q. Um, but for me, that's so bizarre <laughs> to acquire languages without people. I yeah. can't do it. I could not do it. I won't do it. You will never see me <laughs> watch Farsi videos on YouTube. I'm going to acquire Farsi because I'm going to go on YouTube and acquire Farsi. Now, if I lived in Iran and I, and I had to acquire Farsi quickly, or I was going to get a job in Iran or work in Iran or, you know, go to the embassy in Iran, then yeah, I would probably spend as much as I could before I go there I'm using the videos. But to me, that's really weird. I don't. I would never do it. And I think the reason is, I've mentioned this on a Facebook site before, I think most introverts like this. If you're an introvert, you don't talk to people all the time. Naturally, you're not as outgoing as I am. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, this is okay. You're going to use YouTube videos. You're going to use an app like LinkQ. You're yeah. also going to read. Now, reading is so super important. I always tell my students this on the first day. If you're going to get an app or you're going to use YouTube videos, please augment that with reading. Because if you could take my class and read, I think if a student takes my class for 85 hours and reads for 85 hours, I mean, that is the, that is like the holy grail of language acquisition. If you take a class for 85 hours and you read the same amount of hours, that's it. And that is key. And I could do it. I could take German in and read German. But you have to read things that you understand 90%. I've gone to several workshops. Yeah. Karen Rowan, who is one of my favorite Spanish teachers, she has her own business called Fluency Fast, another good business. And excuse me, another good website for people who want to acquire languages. Uh, I don't work for her, by the way. <laughs> uh, she, she gave a talk once where she did a lot of research. Oh, she didn't do it as a as Japanese teacher in Japan. And uh, they decided that... Uh, the sweet spot is 90%. So if you're going to do reading in a, in a second or third language, in a new language, you have to understand 90% of what you're reading. Otherwise, you're not getting the best benefit. You'll get some, yeah. but the sweet yeah. spot is 90%. So in my advanced Spanish class, in my Spanish 3 and my Spanish 4, they read for 10 minutes every day. So if, you, if you're one of those people, if you're an introvert, you just want to take a language, please augment it with reading. I don't need it. I'm not an introvert. I'm a super extrovert. So if I take a language, if you tell me, Jeff, I want you to take, um, let's say Portuguese. Jeff, we need you to learn or our Portuguese. You're going to Brazil next year. I'm going to make as many Brazilian friends as I can. If right. you tell me, Jeff, I want you to take German. I want you to take German because I want you to acquire German. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say, look, I don't have any German friends. I live in Southern California. There's just not a huge German community. I'm just not interested. So for me to take a language, I have to be, first I have to be able to practice the language. So if you're going to say, we want you to take Arabic or Indonesian. I'd say, okay, well, I live in Southern California. I'm going to hear a lot more Arabic than Indonesian. So I always choose my languages by, am I going to be able to practice them? Right. So uh, number one, am I going to be able to practice? Number two, can I make friends who speak that language? And then number three, can I get to that country easily? So yeah, Danish is a wonderful language. Norwegian are wonderful languages, but I'm just never going to use them. So right. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm just not interested. I'm interested in Korean, Tagalog, and what else? Farsi and other languages that are here in Southern California. Right. right. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. Like I, I'm more of an introvert, like you said, mm -hmm. but I, I'm fine with combining both. For me, it's just about, so I live in Poland now, so I, mm -hmm. yeah, good. Have access to German people, of course, but I know it's 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 easier for me to get exposed to Polish on a daily basis, and then when I'm home, I'm just gonna uh, listen to German. So I get to a point in which I can start using the real world in in, in not in the more efficient because I don't want to look at people in that in those terms. But you know, I, I can get to a point in which I can communicate, right? Mm -hmm. So it's to me, it's a combination of both, but I'm also 
the thing about watching YouTube videos or reading at home is that it depends a hundred percent on me, right? On how much time I want to put in. And I, I don't need, I, I'm not meeting anybody who's going to um, put our meeting off because of whatever, you know, uh, of course, there's all these little things that are not really that problematic, right? But I know the, the fact that I, I can control the process and uh, completely, mm -hmm. it helps me, right? Because <laughs> I can do it every day and without depending on <clears throat> anybody else, right? But <clears throat> obviously, the, <clears throat> but, um, the, the ultimate goal is to be able to communicate in the lab with. So, no. Yeah, I'm fine with both, but yeah. That's that's my approach, mm -hmm. and I, I'm also curious about because I, I've I've seen some of your videos and you you talked about it uh, about it with your experience in Vietnam, France, and so on. That you've done a lot of language exchanges, right? And you've mm -hmm. done so. Have you done cross talk a lot, or what? <clears throat> uh, I'm super about cross talk. Uh, I know cross talk because of the Facebook group that we belong to. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what crosstalk is because I don't really do at this point. I don't do any exchanges anymore. I'm not working on any languages right now. Okay. So right now, all my languages are on hold. I'm on a hiatus, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to? Do you want me to talk about how I do exchanges, or do you want yeah. to talk? About, okay, so exchange. I'll just talk about exchanges. I mean, exchanges are wonderful. In fact, my friend Stephen said I should make uh, write a book on exchanges, just language exchange. I've done thousands and thousands of language exchanges. I love language exchange. It's I just love it. Um, basically, language exchange is super easy. It means you trade your language for somebody else's language. And me being an English speaker, as a native English speaker, oh my God, I have a huge advantage. Just the fact that I was born an English speaker gives mm -hmm. me a job advantage in the world i'll just throw that out there but for language exchange i mean i'm an english speaker i could ex i could get online right now i could go to the international session center of my school and find people who want to practice their english or want to acquire english so i've the way i used to do it is i would like i said i would put up posts i would put up signs at the library i put up signs at the uh the, the school where i teach i put up signs at the international center that works uh, I used to put ads in, in Craigslist, but we don't I don't really have Craigslist anymore. My Facebook is my favorite. So right now, Facebook is my favorite place to go. So if I go, to, like when I went to Egypt, my last big language was Arabic. When I went to Egypt, I I joined the, oh, what was it? The AUC, the American University at Cairo. And I just joined their Facebook group. Hmm. And then I post, I'm an American living here in Cairo. I want to trade English for Arabic. And my and it just exploded. I mean, I had to take the post down in 10 minutes. I had 20, 20 responses in one minute, which is normal. You know, people right. want to practice what learning or what they're acquiring. So I took the post down. I made some dates. I met some wonderful, wonderful people. And I traded English for Arabic. I did the same thing in all the countries, including Spain. You know, many years ago, including Spain, I traded English for Spanish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mexico. I've done it in Mexico. You know, I've done it in places where I don't even need to do it. I've done it in Mexico just to make friends. It's a great way to make friends. They're yeah, wonderful. Cool. Language learners are wonderful people. Right. right. No, that's oh, true. Uh, so, yeah, it works great. Um, I've got to the point where I just hire tutors. You know, because if you think about it, if you're going to trade an hour of English for an hour of Farsi, you're going to be spending two hours. But if I could just hire a Farsi tutor, which is what I've been doing, you know, but, I, you know, I'm at the point where I can afford to hire a tutor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One person, you know, you might not be able to afford to hire a tutor and you just do trades all day. Plus, I have a full time job. So it works perfect. Young people, they, you know, they trade. And then, um, you know, old people like me, we just hire tutors if, if we can. So yeah, trades are awesome. Mm -hmm. I love trades. I've done them in every language I speak. You name it. Vietnamese, Chinese, Arabic, Farsi, right. Spanish, Italian, French. I've done trades in every language. Now, the only problem with trades is a lot of people say, I've done a video on trade. I did a, a really good YouTube video on trade, which has got a lot of views. Um, you have to bring pictures. 
bring a magazine with pictures because nine times out of 10, if you don't bring anything, you're going to run out of things to talk about. Also, if you do trades, please time them. Please time them. I have a friend who lives in Taiwan. I won't say his name. He lives in Taiwan and I spoke to him. He came back for Christmas and I said, how are your trades going in Taiwan? How's the Chinese going? And he said, not good. He goes, yeah, it's not going good. I'm like, well, what's the problem with the trades? And he goes, we always speak English. <laughs> like, dude, we yeah. always speak English. You're supposed to trade. So I always set my timer. And a lot of people will say no. A lot of people will say, no, no, we don't need to set a timer. I say, yes, we do. We need to set a timer. And they say, I say, should we do English first or Chinese first? And they say, oh, no, Chinese, please. Let's do Chinese first. I say, no, we're going to flip a coin. We're going to flip a coin. In fact, I have an app on my phone, a coin flip. We flip a coin, heads English, tails Chinese, and we'll just do that. And we do an hour of Chinese, an hour of English. But if you don't know the people, I would say do a half hour first. Okay. Half hour of Chinese, half hour of English. Because you might not, you might, the vibe not might not be there. You might not like the person. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah, that's true. No, that's, so that's how it trades. Yeah. Like, well, first of all, it's... I really like what you said about making friends that way because usually with, you know, I, oh, I tend to think about it as a way to improve your language skills or your language knowledge, but it's a great way to meet people as well. Hmm. This is, I mean, it, it, it's it's actually simple, but I Absolutely. never thought of it of it that way, you know. Yeah. And, and also, so you, so you said that you talk for you know, half an hour or an hour. But have you done it uh, in different levels? Like, uh, you know, with Vietnamese, for example, did you start trading languages from scratch? Or, or how do you actually go about it? Meaning, yes, I... If, if I, I you have, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Okay, so in Vietnam, in Vietnam, I wasn't using pictures yet. Okay. It wasn't until I got to China. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I did Chinese. Uh, I started using it pictures i started bringing magazines with me for things to talk about so vietnam and actually a lot of a lot of time in china i didn't i only started in it was in china that i started using pictures so half the time in china i would just go and speak freely speaking about family friends work travel food religion death and dying marriage you name it you could just look around where there's a guy next to talk about work talking about whatever you want so in in vietnam and china uh and france and italy i do we just talked about just open-ended things but my french and italian were very good and my vietnamese and my chinese were so so in arabic no in arabic is when arabic and farsi is when i started bringing magazines it was my magazine and i brought a magazine to every trade because what you want to do is you're going to run out of things to talk about. A lot of times, students run out of things to talk about. So what I do is bring a magazine, open that magazine, and talk about the magazine. Or my favorite are children's stories. I bring children's stories, and I have them tell me the story in my target language. But I never have them translate. Never have them translate. Because most of the words in a children's story are very difficult. Very difficult. You think, oh, I'll just read a children's story. No, you won't. It's just way too difficult. I think most children's stories are written for a child who is about six or seven years old. And I believe six and seven year old children have about two to 3,000 words in their head. Right. As, a, as a beginning Arabic student or a beginning Farsi student, there's no way I have two to 3,000 words in my head. Right. Yeah. And that's really crazy. Yeah. And they use that sort of literary language, like once upon a time, uh, they, they live in. <laughs> Yeah, one. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a fairy who was a, a a wonderful young woman maiden or whatever they want to say. Yeah. And they, they lived happily ever after. So they use expression that you will really use in, in daily life. Not good for a beginning language student. Right, exactly. So when in when it comes to Farsi and Arabic, um, were you more quiet than the other than the others? Meaning, like when when you were speaking Farsi, was the native speaker speaking most of the time, or were no? You... Oh, good question. No, it's always the same. My acquisition is 
always the same. I always want my language parent, my my trade, my partner speaking 90% of the time. 90% of the time. It's all about listening. It's all about listening. Um, if you're a language student out there, you want to do 90% listening and percent speaking. Sorry. Oh, that that language is a product of input, not output. So speaking, speaking is basically basically a waste of time. It's fun. You know, and we do we do it all the time. I'm doing it right now. It's it, it's like it's like baking. You know, when you bake a cake, you bake a cake. You spend hours and hours and hours and hours baking the cake, and nobody do you eat the cake. Speaking is the eating of the cake. When you're speaking. That's the fun part. That's the fun part. Is the speaking. But it takes hours and hours and hours of listening. So every one of my languages, I don't know how I discovered this. Maybe I just remembered my experience at the restaurant, my Mexican, Salvadorian, Guatemalan, and Honduran friends doing most of the speaking. It just naturally occurred to me that, hey, right. I need to listen. I need to listen. I need to listen. So, yeah. you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of a lot of people I know who speak languages poorly are big talkers. <laughs> To, in my opinion, they talk too much. It's too and I've watched people. I've t- I, I took a Chinese class. I took a Chinese class for fun. And I think the people who were the biggest talkers did the worst. They did the worst because they just, they're just not natural listeners. Yep. They want to get their point across. They want to talk, 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 talk. And maybe they're just super, super, super extroverts. And you know, a language class, you need to become, language class, you almost need to become an introvert in the class. Yep. Being an extrovert is great, but you come back and be the introvert in the class. Yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah so it's, it yeah, it makes a lot of sense actually, and I think that that's where the the idea of crosstalk comes comes into play as well. The, so it's basically the idea of like I explained many times, but it's basically to like and language exchange like you're talking about, but throughout the entire hour, two hours, you know, however long it is. Both people are speaking in the native language the whole time. Okay, right. That was, I do the same thing. Okay, so but, so instead of ninety ten, it's a hundred and zero, right? When one whoa a hundred zero, but meaning that, for example, if if now you 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 you're gonna speak English the whole time, and I'm gonna speak Spanish the whole time, right? So we we we're talking about a, t- a certain topic, but when it's my turn to speak. I'm using Spanish, but you reply in English. Okay. You know what I'm All right, let's be I'm a little confused. But you speak Polish. Mm-hmm. You speak Polish. You live in Poland. Yeah. I speak English. Okay, let's say we're doing a Polish English cross talk. You want to learn English? I want to learn Polish. Right. So, so we flip a coin. Let's do let's say Polish for the first hour. Okay, so Who's going to speak Polish? You're going to speak Polish or I'm going to speak Polish or we're both going to speak Polish? Yeah, perfect. So no, 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 the idea is the entire hour we're going to speak both languages. So it, like in, in, in a normal conversation, okay. whenever it's your time to speak, you're using English. Whenever it's my time to speak, I'm using I'm using Polish or Spanish or whatever. Okay, I get it. I and, get it. you know, by, by, um, by realizing that your answers make sense, I know that you understand what, what I'm saying, and vice versa. And this, no one. In, so if you know, half an hour in Polish, half an hour in English, uh, it's an entire hour with both languages. I mind. like it. I like it. I like it. I've never. I think I've tried it once. I, I'm sure I tried it once. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. So you would speak Polish 100 percent of the time, and I would speak English 100 percent of the time. Right. Call this cross talk. Yeah. Oh, I like it. Okay, maybe next time I do a language or acquire, uh, maybe if I jump back into the Farsi, uh, I'll do that. Sounds interesting. I don't know if I'd like it or not. I've yeah, never tried it. I mean, I've tried it probably once. I think you would. It's it's a bit weird at the beginning because when the other person speaking in English, in your case, my natural reaction is to reply in English, right? Yeah. But once why why you get used to it, it's fine because you yeah. could... That the the good part about it is because you know you're gonna reply in your native language, which yeah. you don't have any issues with. Yeah. When the other person is speaking, you're fully uh yeah. it's on what the other person is saying. You're not thinking about what you're gonna say next. Right. right? Yeah. So it's cool. it's more relaxing in that way. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'll try it. Yeah. 
And I have one one last question about the language exchange idea. Um, what was it hard to convince the other person to do it the way you like to do it, or where? Yeah, they... yeah, right. Yes, that's a very good question. So, if you do language exchange, if I do language exchange. 90% of the time, people want to translate. They want to translate. They want to teach me grammar. Mm. They want to correct me. They want to become these traditional language teachers that I don't want. Exactly. So I always warn people. So whenever I get with a language exchange person, I always say, look, we're going to do a language exchange, but number one, please only speak the target language. Mm. All speak, let's say Farsi. Farsi mm -hmm. is my, my most current language. We're going to do Farsi for an, for a half hour. We're going to do English for a half hour. So during the Farsi time, only speak Farsi. So speak 100% of Farsi, unless it's an emergency. You know, if you have an emergency, if I have an emergency, if I get stuck, if you get stuck, then sure, I'll speak English. Right. Remember, please don't teach me any grammar. You don't want to hear any grammar. You know, don't tell me uh, if it's a girl, we say it this way. If it's a boy, we say it this way. If it's three people, we say it this way because... Right. I'm like, no, you know, I don't need that. I just need lots and lots of listening. So please don't teach me any grammar. And then number three, don't correct me. Mm -hmm. It's probably the correcting thing that people find the hardest. Yep. They find that, oh, I have to correct you because we correct people now. And then I just say, look, there's a study by John Truscott. John Truscott is, a, is an English teacher in Taiwan. He's done extensive study on this. And they've found that correction doesn't work. It's just a waste of time. 99% of the time people say, okay, 1% of the time they say no, and they continue to correct me. And then I just don't have a second date with these people. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I tell them to draw. I'm like, let's draw. I draw when we don't understand something. I draw, 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 draw mm -hmm. until they, and until I understand, or I point to stuff or I gesture. And then I go, oh, okay. And then, mm -hmm. and then if, Still no comprehension. We're both stuck. I say, let's just speak English. And oh, okay. And then like once in Vietnam, I with my Vietnamese teacher, I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, I'm talking about the import and export duties in the United States and Vietnam. And I'm like, import, export duties? What are you talking about? I'm talking about cats and dogs. Do you want to talk about import, export duties? So you really need to bring the the conversation way, way down. Right, right, right. Colors, clothing, physical appearance, mm -hmm. like, like cars, boats, dogs. Yeah, you did. Yeah, it has to be comprehensible. Yeah, like I, I, I was just thinking that as you spoke that I don't even know how to talk about that in my native language, like import exports. So I just can talk. Oh. But yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, that's. Sometimes that's probably the, the hardest part, like getting, um, convincing people about doing it this way, because mm. unfortunately we, we've all had the same type of experience yeah. in the languages in school, high school and so on. So it takes a while, but yeah, I want to ask you if you can send me the, um, the research that, that you just talked about, I actually, I can include it in the description. Sure. I'd love to read it myself, of course, but in case any, anybody is interested. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, any final message for language acquirers out there? <laughs> <laughs> the language learners, language acquirers. I don't know. I guess, you know, just have fun. You know, I've, 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 I've discovered that the more fun I have, even in my current class and my current teaching, if I just have fun and not think about, you know, what's my goal, if I get rid of goals, <laughs> if I get rid of goals and just have fun, it usually happens naturally. That's just in my own teaching. Um, as a language student, you know, I don't, I have no goals and just, I have fun and I just, I know it'll come. It's basically all about hours. You know, people like to tell me, oh, you're good at languages because you speak eight languages. I'm like, no, I'm not. I did 800 hours of Arabic, 800 hours. Show me. Show me somebody who's a non-native speaker, a foreigner who's done 800 hours of Arabic. Right. You all find it. Very few. That's why I speak Arabic. I speak Arabic because I did 800 hours of Arabic, not because I'm good at languages. I mean, it helps. You know, it's like, it's like you know, exercising. You know, calories in, calories out. You want to be 
you gotta you have to you have enough you have to take in fewer calories and burn more calories language acquisition exactly the same you just need tons and tons of hours in tons and tons of hours in and then that's how languages occur yeah yeah exactly yeah i like that i like that i like that no goal um <laughs> yeah way to go about it yeah i like it um, hours are my goal my only goal right. is hours. Right. my only goal is hours in hours in is my only goal yeah you'll get to get to it you'll get to it we'll get to it yeah and then, uh, as long as it's comprehensible it's it's yeah. how much time you're putting in is that's quote unquote simple yeah Exactly. Okay. So yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. And yeah, I'll leave the link to your YouTube channel or whatever you want me to link to. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've just started doing TikToks. Well, so I'm putting all my classes on TikTok. All of my classes. Right now I teach three Spanish classes, mm -hmm. two big Spanish and one uh, Spanish, I guess we call it Spanish three, third semester Spanish. And TikTok is, you know, people are not watching YouTube the way they used to. Right. So uh, now TikTok. So TikTok, Instagram, and uh, my podcast, all three I'm using. But, so you're, you're, you're chopping those videos for YouTube? Like for, I mean, for YouTube, for TikTok, like little yeah. man. What I do is I put all my homework, all my stories, my homeworks, my listening activities. I put, I put the same video, TikTok, Instagram, and podcast. Mm -hmm. So my get to choose. I don't know which they prefer, but they can do TikTok, Instagram, or podcast, and that's their homework. Nice, nice. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave all the links down in the description. Awesome. And yeah, it's been a pleasure, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear this podcast. I'm going to share this with my students. So as soon as you finish it, you know, a week, two weeks, whatever, just send me the link. And then I'll put it, I'll, I'll leave it for my students. I'll go make them do it. I, I've got, you know, one thing I've got to the point, I don't make students do anything, mm -hmm. you know, really dull. It's just, I can't, it just doesn't work, you know? Yes. So it'll be optional. This this, yeah. this podcast will be optional for them to listen to. Yeah, yes. It's part of their interest and they, they, they'll, they'll do it themselves if they're interested. Yeah, exactly. But if, if they're not, there's nothing you can do, <laughs> you know right? Nothing, nothing. It, it may actually be that those little cases in which, or those, you know, little cases in which they might actually be interested, be, but because you force them to do it, they lost the interest. No, that's, so that's, that's even more dangerous than that. Yeah. That's a different subject. I'm motivated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I will say this. The most important thing about language acquisition, the most important thing is motivation. How motivated are you? It's number one. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's where, you know, um enjoying every single minute of it, meeting people and watching videos, that's when it comes into play. Because it's way easier to to be motivated when you're having fun, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much for watching this interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. And uh, if you want to know more about language learning, language acquisition, like, you know, what's what's the best way to learn a language, ideas for language learning, uh, the best resources at different levels. Here, you can find the whole playlist with all the interviews I've done so far with different researchers, teachers, polyglots, and so on. And finally, right here, you smash this guy right in the face to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.